Happy New Year, listeners. It's good to be back. This is Join Us in France, episode 218. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent. Are you getting ready for a trip to Paris, Provence, Normandy, maybe somewhere else in France? On this podcast, you'll hear conversations about France. I publish three types of episodes. Trip Reports, where I invite listeners who had a great trip to France, come share their, the best of their trip and give you inspiration and tips for your own vacation in France. Number two, conversations with licensed tour guides. Most of the time, it's my friend Elise, because she can tell us about French history, art, architecture, etc. And this is also where we take you off the beaten track to places you may have never heard of, but should consider checking out. Number three, solo shows with me, Annie, to clue you in about how to be a savvy traveler in France, share my love of French food, wine and culture on my quest to rediscover my own country. On today's episode, a trip report with Scott Fisher from Calgary, Canada, about his four-day trip to Paris. Scott has some great tips to share with all of us, and he's also a wonderful photographer. I invite you to check out his photography and the transcript for our conversation on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 218, and look for the blue button that says transcript and photos. <laughs> Bonjour, Scott, and welcome to join us in France. Thank you, Annie. Hello to you. Yes. Um, well, tell us briefly, uh, we're talking on Skype. Uh, where do you live? live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Ooh, very nice. Is it cold? Uh, no, actually, we're having a pretty typical summer over here. It's It's been nice. We've had some hot, hot days. We've had some cooler summer days, but it's been good. Oh, good. All right. So how many trips have you done to France so far? Just one. Just the one. Just the one. Yes. And that's why today we're going to, going to talk about things that you can do to make your first trip to France better. Since you're Canadian, maybe you you knew a little bit of French? I, I know a little bit. and I think I know enough, you know, to say hello and uh, a couple of small phrases. And my, my wife's probably better at it than I am, so... <laughs> I, I let her do some of the talking. <laughs> yeah, did you think that was a hindrance on your trip, or was that fine? No, not at all. Yeah. Uh, we we found most people were pretty receptive. You you say bonjour when you walk into a to a restaurant, and they say bonjour back, and um, most people were receptive. They they knew you weren't able to maybe communicate, so they helped us out. That's great. So you went with your wife on this trip. I did, yes. Mm -hmm. Any kids? Uh, they did not come along, no. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that's, that makes it a little bit easier, doesn't it? It does, yes. So tell me, why did you pick France? We, we ended up going to France because of flights, actually, oh. uh, to, get, to get to Europe uh, from Calgary. There was a, an excellent deal on flights, and we took advantage of that, and we ended up flying into Charles de Gaulle in Paris, and that's where we started our trip. Very good. And you stayed in Paris, right? We did, yes. Yeah. How many days? We were there for four days. Four days. So it was pretty quick. Yeah, it, it was, yeah. It left a lot of things on the list to do <laughs> to go back a second time. I know that. Yeah, was the was the jet lag a problem? Because that's barely enough time to get used to the new time. Um, no, we we got in midday on a Sunday, and we just said once we get in, we have to stay awake. We can't go have a nap or anything <laughs> like that. So we started uh, right from right from the point we landed. We just said we have to keep going, and we we headed off once we got into town. So. Yeah, yeah, excellent. All right, okay, so how did you find out about the show? 
I started looking around on the internet and I discovered your podcast and I, I think I pulled them up on my Spotify and started listening to them. And I told my wife I'd send them to her. I said, you got to listen to this one or you got to listen to that one because, you know, <laughs> you, you we may curated. be going there. <laughs> yeah, you curated them. <laughs> I did. I That's did. Good, I, was, I was filtering them for her so that she knew exactly where we would be going, I think. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, that's good. Oh, very good. Okay. So where did you choose to stay? What neighborhood of Paris did you pick? And, and how? I think that's one of the questions that comes up a lot with people who are preparing their trip to, to Paris in particular is which, you know, which part of Paris are we going to stay in? Yeah, we, we ended up in, I don't know, I'll probably get the name slightly wrong, but I believe it's wrong. It's uh, Le Marais. Le Marais, yeah. Yeah, and um, for us, it, it was really a couple of things. One was your podcasts on you know areas in in Paris and where to stay. Yeah. Uh, another, we had come across a, a young lady who's a solo traveler, and she had done a blog on places and locations and hotels, and basically, she had stayed in a hotel in very, uh, I guess, very close to where we had stayed. And uh, we started looking around at the prices. And next thing you know, we were going, okay, this looks like the sort of neighborhood. Um, we looked for something that was close to the metro. That was important to yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, from a access standpoint, uh, we also take a look on the Google Maps and see if there's, you know, restaurants and grocery stores and things like that that are uh -huh. nearby. We like to know where there's a grocery store so that we can quickly, you know, run down, grab some water or something to eat. Yeah, and Paris has a lot of small grocery stores in areas like the Marais, Saint-Germain-des-Prés. There are a lot of, you know, just neighborhood little stores, but they're great for everyday items. Yeah, and that's that's basically what we were looking for was some place that we could easily get onto a metro really quickly. Um, we could find uh, whatever we needed if we needed a uh, you know something to cover up a blister on a foot or something. Is yeah, there a, yeah. <laughs> a pharmacy nearby or is there a grocery store? Because in in some cases we were quite tired from the day and we would go back in the middle of the afternoon and just grab a light snack at the grocery store. Sure. Sure, that sounds like that sounds like a good idea. All right, so you were next to which metro station? Do you remember? Yeah, we were next to the. Uh, which one is it now? I always get it wrong. Saint Paul. Saint Paul, yes. Yeah. Okay. Saint Paul is yeah the major um, metro station in Le Marais. And when was this trip? We got in on the third of June. Okay, twenty eighteen. Yes. Okay. So, so, did you go with a hotel or did you go with an apartment? We went with a hotel. Uh -huh. we, we stayed. We stayed at the uh, Hotel de Neuve, and it was it was really a, a nice a bit of a boutique hotel, but it was a nice accommodation. It so, was, how, do you, how do you spell that? Hotel de uh, N E U V E. Okay. And. Yep. Basically, we were we weren't looking for a four star. This is a three star hotel, but it, uh -huh. it's comfortable, mm -hmm. clean, um, you know, friendly staff, uh, very helpful to us when we were trying to figure out a few of the things that we needed to figure out on our trip. That's good. Did they have an elevator? And they had an elevator. That was another important aspect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we you definitely, definitely wanted a hotel yeah. with an elevator. Yeah, and air conditioning maybe? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, this year in Paris, June wasn't too tremendously bad uh, as far as the heat. It was kind of humid, but not very, very hot. But um, some years, June, even May can be quite hot, quite warm. So, yeah. Yes, we, we, we definitely look for those things, elevator, air conditioning, They were important to us. We had considered B&B. We did look at um, renting an apartment. Uh, we just weren't really certain whether we wanted to do that. We have done it in other places that we have traveled to, so yeah. it was an option. Yeah, but four days is a, is short, I think, for a rental. I mean, I don't know. I, I would consider a rental 
for five, six, seven days or more. But, uh, you know, four days, yeah, you barely have time to get in that you have to clean it up and leave. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And and I think for us, when we looked at it, it was roughly about the same price range when we were comparing hotels and, and B&Bs. Yep. The, you know, just because we were two travelers, we weren't four or six or eight people exactly. looking for, for exactly. a, a larger accommodation. Right. If, if you bring in your kids or if you're going with in-laws or friends or something, then yes, it's worth looking at uh, Airbnbs. For just two people, I think a hotel is, is probably a very good choice. All right. So can you tell us some of the things that were your favorite things that you did in, in those four days? Well, we we definitely wanted to get out and see the city. We 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 walked a lot. We were doing, I think, about twenty kilometers a day of walking. Wow! And and so you know, we we love walking around in the neighborhoods and just seeing the neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, and obviously, we we also enjoy the museums. There's some fantastic museums in Paris, and. Yeah, uh, we did go see the Louvre, and we did go see the Orsay. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, probably the most interesting spot was to go to the Arc de Triomphe. Really? Yes, and and that's mostly because of my interest in uh, Le Tour de France. So ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to be uh, on top of the Arc de Triomphe and look down the Champs Elysees and and see that stretch of road and just imagine the cyclists racing up and down that road was uh-huh. was kind of a that was sort of my my bucket list item anyway. Oh, that's great! That's great. Yes, that's see that wouldn't see that's why it's good to talk to different people about their trip to France because this is not something I would have thought of to put on anybody's uh, you know. I mean, I will watch the Tour de France once in a while on TV, but it's it's not like something that I watch every day or anything. Right, <laughs> right. And for me, I'm I'm I, you know, I get to work and I, I bring up the website and I follow the race until the the stage is finished that day. And uh, and you know, we've only got a couple more days left uh, yeah, of racing. Yeah, it's almost. Yeah, it's almost finished as we it record is. this episode. Yeah, we are re- yes. yeah, we're recording on, uh, what day is it today? The 28th of uh, July, 2018. So um, it's almost over. Almost. And I have no idea who's going to win. Do, do you... <laughs> mm. <laughs> it, it really, I think until they get to, the, to Paris, it might not be decided. Uh, so it's tight. It is, yes. That's cool. That's very cool. Okay. Yeah, this year I only had attention for one sporting event. And, of course, I watched a little bit of the soccer. Yes. yes. <laughs> which, was, which was a concern for the Tour de France, as a matter of fact, because they, they knew that they were going to have a lot of competition for eyeballs with the mm-hmm. soccer games. And so they modified the schedule quite a lot just to, just to be able to, you know, to get enough viewers that it would be... Because it's very popular in France and elsewhere, obviously. But right. if it's competing with other major sports events, it's it can be a problem. Right. Okay, so the, the Arc de Triomphe was your favorite. Maybe what was your wife's favorite? Uh, definitely museums are her thing. So, huh. um, and and I was talking to her about this last night, and I asked her. I said, "So, which museum did you enjoy the most?" Because we we went to the Louvre, the Orsay. We went to the Picasso Museum and oh, wow. the Rodin Museum. Wow. And um, for her, the Wings of Victory in the Louvre is, is a big highlight. Ah. And she really enjoyed seeing the, that particular piece. And, yeah. And the Louvre itself was fantastic. Yeah. But she does absolutely love the Orsay and the Impressionists as well. So. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a couple of uh, Monet pictures in the in the Orsay that she really enjoyed getting a chance to see. So. To see that for real, yeah, it's a bit, it yeah. makes a big difference. I've have had people that I've taken on tours and stuff, and they and they just stop in front of a painting and say, "Oh, I have a print of this in my house," right? <laughs> and they're always very excited to see it for real, you know, because um, it's yeah. it's better. <laughs> the real thing well, is it, better. It, it, it is, and I think even the fact that everyone loves to go see the Mona Lisa, and we certainly were 
a couple of people that went and stood nearby first thing in the morning <laughs> when the crowd was small. Oh, that's but, good. But we did find, you know, we found other little nooks and crannies that we, we certainly enjoyed seeing different bits and pieces of art. And my wife has spent an entire week in the Met in New York. So oh. she, you know, she was very ready to see some of the other pieces that were in the Orsay and, and the Louvre as well. She knew what she wanted. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That, <laughs> and, and that's really important. And the Picasso Museum was quite interesting. I, I found it quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's a, a much smaller museum, but it fit into our schedule because we had certain things that we were doing in, in different parts of the day. Mm -hmm. And we only spent a couple of hours at, at the Picasso. And sure. same thing for the Rodin. You know, yeah. To see the, the thinker and, and the Burgermeisters was, was quite interesting. Yeah. And, and besides, you were staying in the Marais, so you're quite close to the Picasso Museum. Yes. Yes. So you might as well enjoy it. Right. That's... And it gave us a chance to sort of explore that area as well. There's some unique little shops and some neat uh, neat shopping and stuff up in that area as well. Mm -hmm. And so you went to, you, you got the museum pass, right? We did, yes. Right. What did, what did you think? Was that a good deal for you? It did. It, it, it worked very well for us. Uh, we purchased it at the Rodin Museum, which was the first museum we went to. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, we were able to get into the museums quickly because you don't have to stand in the ticket line. Right. And it did work very well. We, right. We got really good value, I mm -hmm. think, having mm -hmm. that. And it's uh, honestly, I recommend it for every. Everyone who thinks they're going to go into museums, if, you, if you're not going to see any museums, obviously, there's no point. But, but there are people who do the math, you know, they say, oh, well, to make it worth it, you have to go see two museums a day and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't really, I don't think that's where the real value of it is. The value is you get in quickly. And, yes. And if you, if for some reason you need to exit the museum because you're not feeling well or and you think you'll go back later, you can totally do that. And I, I think it's, it's a really easy way. And you did it right. You purchased it at the first museum you went to, which is the Rodin Museum. It's not one that has huge lines, typically. Uh, so, so, so you didn't have to wait very long even to buy it in the first place. No, no. And our intention was to go to the Louvre for a portion of a day and then to actually go back in an evening. Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen because we ended up spending an entire day in the Louvre, which was, was wonderful. <laughs> but uh, just kind of a change of plans. But like you say, if we did want to go back for a second visit, having the pass would allow us to do right, that. And right. That would have been nice. Right. And, and I, I definitely don't recommend that you go line up to get your museum pass at the Louvre because the line there can be really long. So if you know your first museum is going to be the Louvre, then probably a good way to buy your pass is at the tourist info desks at the airport. Yes. Uh, you can just stop at one of them. They're really easy to find. They're obvious in the in the way <laughs> and yeah. you stop there and you can buy your museum pass you can get information about various things i think that's and, a good plan and that was our intention as well was when we landed in charles de gaulle was to look for an information desk to buy the pass from mm -hmm. what had happened though was we had arranged for a, a, a car service and the fellow was waiting right there for us when we got ah. out and kind of kind of ushered us straight out to the car and next yeah. thing you know we were on our way into Paris. So. Yeah, you skipped that you skipped that part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so, okay. That's okay. Yes. And and just to mention for uh, you know people who are new listeners, uh, you can also buy the museum pass in various places in Paris. One thing I wouldn't mess with is getting them sent to my house because you never know with the mail, you might get them too late or something. So just just either the uh, visitors info booth at the airport or if your first museum is going to be a minor museum, then go to that. And I also want to mention that, and this is another question that comes up a lot, uh, the Paris Pass. Is it worth it? There's a big difference between the Paris Pass and the Museum Pass. The Paris Pass is pretty much uh, a museum pass plus a transportation pass. 
and they probably have other goodies. I haven't researched it in detail. But you end up paying a lot more than if you were buying your museum pass and your metro tickets or metro card separately. So I don't so, recommend that you go with uh, Paris Pass. The one thing that we were not sure of when we bought the museum pass, and, and as you mentioned, having it delivered to the house... So for us, the shipping fees for that particular pass to come to Calgary are quite high. Right. And, and that was enough for us to say, we're not going to do that. Right. We're not going to worry about it. There's the no only concern, need. Yeah. And the only concern we had was we didn't know if we had to book a particular time for accessing a museum uh, ah. when when we had the pass, would we have to have our pass information in order to book a time to enter or something like that? And I think right. I had actually posted something to the Facebook group and asked about it, and I did get a response back saying, no, no, you don't need to worry about that. Right. Just get your pass and you skip all of the, the ticket lines and all that stuff and you go in a, a separate entrance. Right. So your choices in Paris are... Either you don't buy anything in advance and you will be sta standing in very long, unpleasant lines for both buying the ticket and security. Or mm -hmm. your second choice is you buy the museum pass, which allows you quick entrance at any time. So you don't have to tell them when you're coming. You can just go right in whenever you're ready. Or you could also buy timed tickets for specific museums. And this is good for people who don't want to go see many museums, but they happen to want to go see the Orsay or the Louvre. Then they go to their website and they say, okay, I'm going to come to the Orsay at that time, you know, and they give you a f kind of a bracket, like you, you, you know, you come at 10 or you come at 11 or something, you know, and, right. and that's, that's also another way to do it where you don't wait very long at all. But the worst way is to not plan anything and not have a museum pass because then the lines can be very, very long. I'm talking hours. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We, we discovered that on our way around uh, heading to the Orsay. We had ended up in that particular section of, of t the city and thought, well, we'll just, we'll just go since mm -hmm. we're right here. Yeah. And we came around the corner and the, the lineup was very large. So we changed plans. <laughs> Mm, mm. So even for Museum Pass, the line was long? Because well, you enter do, at a different place. They they had us in the security line with ah, everybody. Yeah, the security line. And, yeah. and yeah. so once we got through the security line, then we were able to bypass the ticket section and, right. and go right. in. But mm -hmm. uh, when we got there, it was middle of the day, and the lineup was quite large. So yeah, we, yeah. we just decided we'll come back in the morning when we can get here slightly ahead of opening. Mm -hmm. And just to finish up on the museum pass, if you're coming to Paris with teenagers or children, they do not need a museum pass. They will. Most museums in Paris are free for kids under 18. Now, theoretically, mm -hmm. the rule is European kids under 18, but I've never seen that uh, uh, being enforced anywhere because they really don't have the time to ask you for your papers and see if your kid was really born in the EU and, oh, but now England is in, in the EU and, you know, it's too complicated. So they just, any children, the only time when they might question it is if your kid is uh, 17 and often American, North American kids look older because they're taller and they just ma seem to mature faster. I don't know. Uh, and so, and so they might question is th this person looks 21 to me, not 18 or not 17, you know? Uh, right. But you don't need to take, you don't need to buy a museum pass for your kids. And that's the other problem with the Paris pass is that they make you buy one for your kids too. When they know very well that they don't need those tickets. It's, I think it's a ripoff, but okay. Uh, <laughs> that's just me. That's just me. All right. So how did you get around Paris? You walked a lot, you said. We did, yes. We, we basically took the metro when we wanted to make large kind of leaps across the city. Mm -hmm. And then whatever station we were coming out at. And then we would certainly just start walking and, and 
especially on our first day was really kind of a, you know, you're tired from the flight and everything else, but we just said, okay, well, we know from our hotel, we know Notre Dame is roughly in that direction. We just started yeah. walking and, and heading in that direction and, and you start to see things and you wander and meander through each one of those little sections as you go. Yeah. Yeah. So did you, when you were walking like that, what did, what did you do to break things up? Did you stop at cafes? Did you have ice cream things, whatever meals? Yeah. Yeah. We, we took time to, to wander into some of the small parks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I'm, I had my camera with me all the time, so I was certainly uh, stopping and, and taking photos <laughs> of, of buildings and, and things and people. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the flowers, uh, amazing smelling roses in, in Paris. I don't know what, what it is about the roses in, in France, but they smell tremendously. They like um, the they like the climate. Roses uh, love the climate here. Yeah, they, they just were very noticeable. Mm -hmm. But uh, for us, yeah, it was really just a, a case of, even though we covered a lot of distance, was not to make it a sprint or anything. It was mm -hmm. it was much more of a, you know, if we felt like sitting down at a cafe, we would, or mm -hmm. or we would find a park where there was a park bench and just sit down for a bit and people watch and, you know, maybe even check the map a little bit and figure out roughly where we were going next. So do you use the paper map? Uh, we had one from the hotel, uh -huh. and it was it was good, but it was uh, it was mostly Google Maps. Um, mm -hmm. And my wife had downloaded, I think, a couple of uh, self guided walking tours as well. Mm -hmm. And I had also pulled down a couple of um, uh, items from your podcast from your website from mm -hmm. the, the Join Us in France website, where you had put here's a Here's a few various things that you can do and wander through and see. So I, mm -hmm. I, we had some of those that we had put into PDF and she had them on her phone. So we would occasionally kind of be thumbing through a PDF to figure out, well, okay, they, they mentioned this one. Where's that? And, yeah. You know, you start to kind of plot your course roughly through the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Oh. So you, you didn't get a, a metro pass. Did you just get... Metro tickets? We just bought tickets. Yeah, yeah, we we looked at the Metro Pass and uh, we decided since we were doing and this was basically after the first day since we were doing the walking and we found the walking easy enough to do that we really didn't see the value in having a full pass and mm -hmm. we just bought the individual trip tickets which were mm -hmm. it's very simple. You know, it, I found the Metro system in Paris extremely easy to use. Mm -hmm. You walked up. You walked. You, you selected English on the uh, on the machine, and you just pick your book of ten tickets, and it would print out your ten tickets, kind of thing. It was pretty straightforward, yep. and yep. you know, easy access through the turnstile and onto the metro. And yeah, no my problems. only problem with metro tickets is that I always uh, I use a for my cell phone. I use a, a magnifying thing, so it sticks in my car, and I can get it to to my wallet, whatever. And that always erases my metro tickets. And so I have to keep them really separate from my cell phone or they get demagnetized. Right. And then you have to go and stand in line and get them to issue, you know, remagnetize them. And you get it. Yeah. And I get a lecture every time. Don't keep <laughs> them next to your cell phone. <laughs> yeah, we didn't run into any, any major problems using the metro and using the tickets. It was, yeah, it I was think, easy. probably... I think the only thing was I, I left, I think I might have left a couple in my shirt pocket and we didn't know where they were. Ah, <laughs> so, well, that's okay. And just it, FYI, everybody, when you use the metro in Paris, you have to keep your ticket until you exit because they will check them. I don't, did you get checked in the four days? No, we didn't. Mm. We we didn't see anyone coming through the car or anything like that that was asking for verification. So mm -hmm. it's usually at the turnstiles that they that they check. So you need to keep it the whole time you're in the metro. When you're out, you're fine. You can throw them away. Um, but yeah. Okay. Did you feel safe in Paris? Yeah, we did. We we certainly wandered around. A lot, and uh, I don't think at any point we felt like we had wandered into a neighborhood where we felt uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. 
um, the tourist areas, you know, there's, there's, we certainly experienced, like I'm sure most people do, you know, the people coming up to you trying to sell you something or trying to get oh. you to the typical little scammy things, you know, like sign my petition stuff and whatnot. But yeah, um, we experienced all that and we just, we had already known about the fact that again, you know, the, the podcasts <laughs> helped a lot with that. Yeah. Because knowing what those scams are, you can immediately just dismiss the people and just tell them no. and No, and, and walk just, on. Yeah, just keep moving and, and so on. So um, we never felt like we were in any particular danger anywhere. We certainly noticed a couple of times there was um, the, the police uh, were present. Just mm-hmm. in a in a general fashion, not in any emergency situation or anything like that. But they were mm-hmm. there, and especially around uh, the Eiffel Tower, there's yeah. certainly a lot more of them. Oh yeah, and and you know, again, we there's plenty of people around on the park out front and so on. So yeah, we we felt really comfortable, and we did go out in the evenings. Uh, I did some night photography and wandered around, the, you know, in some of the the side streets and stuff like that, taking photos. And, mm-hmm. um, we, we never felt like we had any concerns. It was, it was very comfortable. Um, most, most of the time, I think it's just the typical precautions. You know, you don't, don't, uh, leave your bag unattended on the sidewalk sort of thing. And don't, you know, don't flash stuff around too much. Don't have your phone out unless you absolutely need to. Mm-hmm. Um, those sorts of things help. Right. And also, you you know, what? unfortunately, when people get robbed, it's often that somebody will grab something small that you have. So it's going to be your your phone or your wallet, something f- small that they can grab and run. And typically, those sorts of theft, it happens in the metro right as the doors are going to close or in a, in a train right as the doors are going to close because they time it. You know, they watch you with your phone in your hand from behind and then you just grab it and run and there's not a thing you can do. Yeah, and we we were very conscious on the Metro. There was at no point that we pull out cell phones or even for me, my camera was in it. I had a particular camera bag with me and my camera was always put away so that it wasn't, I didn't set it on my lap or anything like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, from a walking around standpoint, initially I, I, we did have money belts. Uh, mm-hmm. We did u- we did use them occasionally, but most of the time I kept my wallet in my front shirt pocket, mm. and um, I didn't have any problems. I, I might have had a, a couple of bit of euro, you know, a couple of euro in my front pocket, and that would be about it. Mm-hmm. You know, just some loose change, really. Mm-hmm. And and my wife, she carried a, a small uh, smaller purse that she could just sling across and keep in front of her and and that's the way she traveled and we left the you know the the passports were were not with us out on the streets or anything like that so um but yeah we never ran into any situations that i would say we felt uncomfortable even and we certainly saw um like i say all those typical scams that go on but yeah you know like you say you just Simply tell them no and and carry on and yep. do what you're doing. And for the most part, they didn't harass us beyond, you know, trying to approach you. And once they realized that you weren't interested, they left us alone. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk with you about photography a little bit. You mentioned it uh, some sure. already, but uh, you sent me some. I ask everybody who comes on the podcast to send me some photos. And I noticed yours right away because they were obviously very high quality photos taken with a DSLR, you know, a, a, a nice camera. So I want to hear more. What's your photography set up and, uh, and uh, what did you think about uh, doing photos in Paris? Well, uh, first thing I thought of when we booked the trip was this is the city of lights, so a, a person needs to, you know, go and and take some photos at night because mm-hmm. it's a city that is just absolutely beautiful at night. Um, mm-hmm. For me, from a camera perspective, I shoot with a a, a Nikon D810, so it's a a little mm-hmm. bit bigger camera. Yeah. Um, I was traveling with three lenses mm-hmm. and and a tripod. 
Ooh. And yeah, Ooh. <laughs> I, I, I was, it was a justification for a very light travel tripod. So, oh, um, that's what I know. need. I took yeah. my tripod out last night and it must weigh 10 kilos. <laughs> yes. I'm like, I have to sell this thing and get a normal tripod. This is ridiculous. Yeah, anyway. no, I, I did manage to um, find a, a reasonably priced carbon fiber tripod, which was, uh, travel sized and and it worked excellent for the trip mm-hmm. but I, I i actually did a little bit of looking on a couple of websites um i i, I use 500 px um mm-hmm. and i was looking at people that went to paris so i just searched for paris and there's lots of photography in paris and i looked at the lenses that people were using mm-hmm. for their images And most people were shooting a 24 to 70 lens. So that was, I have one and uh, and that's my, my main lens. And I figured, okay. That's the one I use all the time in Paris. Yeah. And so that was my intention was I'll I'll take a 24 to 70 and that will be my main walk around lens. Mm -hmm. Uh, I carried a small 35 millimeter prime just in case something happened to the 24 to 70. Oh, okay. And And then my wife says, bring your bring your big zoom lens she's like well you might need that and I really hummed and hawed about it because I didn't think I would but I did throw it in the bag so How I big? ended up it's a 70 to 200 okay and we have and, pretty much the same setup except I'm yeah, Canon but same right and so when we were out um I actually I did use all three of my lenses in mm-hmm. various at various times so on days when uh we were specifically the Louvre is a great example. I didn't want to carry a big camera in the Louvre, so I just threw the small 35 millimeter lens on the front and Mm -hmm. it's a lot lighter setup and it doesn't feel like you're dragging a boat anchor with you. (laughs) But uh, um, from a photography standpoint, I did do a photo walk with with a group in in Paris. And so um, I used uh, Aperture Tours was the group that I had used. Uh-huh. And I scheduled, they have various tours, so I scheduled a night one because uh-huh. I wanted to actually do some night photography. And I felt these people might have a bit better idea where to photograph some of the locations at sure. night. And so uh, obviously going out with them, they might have a little bit more of a uh, an insight as to how to get from one location to another a little quicker and so on. Oh, sure, sure. So, but, uh, so where did yeah, they take we, you? Uh, we started off at the Louvre. Yeah. And unfortunately, exterior. That day, yeah, the Louvre, the gates were closed, so we couldn't get into the square. Oh. By the by, the pyramids. Oh. And, and there was some event or something going uh-huh. on, which yeah. was unfortunate. But we did uh, we did do some photography in and around there, and then we headed over towards Notre Dame. And we did some photography from along the side of the uh, the Seine River mm-hmm. and towards Notre Dame. And then we did some side streets. So we were just meandering down some side streets and looking right. for some interesting buildings and that sort of thing. Yeah, Ile Saint-Louis and Ile de la Cité have some interesting tiny streets. There's a few places with like interesting steps and, and vines yes. that just happen to yes. grow in the right place. You know, it's it's cool. Yes, and that's that's exactly what we were looking for is that sort of thing. And then yeah. we we made our way back uh, over to the far side of the uh, the Louvre, and we were looking for an interesting angle. Um, and I think we were in the sort of on the edge of the Tuileries there, mm-hmm. uh, and we took a, a shot of of the Eiffel Tower over top of of the city mm. um, as it was sparkling, of course, and. Of course. And um, then we made our way back to the Louvre, and the interesting thing was whatever was going on had finished, but they had gates up, so you couldn't actually get near the entrance. Mm. And so our our guide, and it was just me, the guide, and and my my wife, and so he's like, let's just see how far we can go. And so we started wandering and we wandered past the gate and I, I guess the event must have been pretty much over or something, but uh, mm. they they never said anything. And we ended up on the backside of, of the pyramid 
and we're mm-hmm. able to get a, a wonderful photograph of the pyramid with nobody in it. That's cool. Um, and so, yeah, it actually turned out really well that way. So. And could you? But could you see the 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 fencing, whatever they were using to keep people out? No, no. Okay. Uh, we we framed it up so that we didn't get a lot of that in, that's good. in the shot. So yeah, that's cool. But um, and then you know, from a photography standpoint, like I say, I was doing a lot of street photography because we were certainly exploring neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, we did we we did a walk with a Paris greeter. Oh, and cool. um, they showed us around their neighborhood that they grew up in and they still live in. Uh huh. And and so which neighborhood was, was that? That was over in I th- is it the 16th okay. arrondissement? Yeah. Uh, we got off at Somebody posh. La Mouette uh, okay. station, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and they were basically showing us the architecture, and the, there's a couple of main architects that built a, a lot of buildings. Uh-huh. In, in that area and so yeah a lot of building photography at that point which I don't really have a I don't have a tilt shift lens to you know straighten mm. up the buildings with but um yeah I don't was, have that either and and I think that's something you know there's Paris is one of those cities for me there was just a never-ending list yeah. of things that you know I was I was taking pictures of, of stairwells as as you were asking me yeah uh, uh, I loved looking for circular stairwells in that city and and there's there's a number of them if you can you know sort of spend some time you'll find one uh-huh. somewhere on your travels um, but yeah we we generally speaking we were taking a lot of holiday snaps uh, and then Every once in a while, I was allowed to, you know, sort of spend a little bit more time and, uh, you know, actually think about what I was photographing, maybe do a little bit more composing and and take a little more serious shot. But uh, interestingly enough, a couple of my a couple of my favorite shots actually came off the balcony of our hotel room. (laughs) Um, And uh, we we were lucky enough that we were on the top floor and had uh-huh. a small balcony off the top and I just pulled up the tripod and my long lens and I got a couple of wonderful yeah. shots. So uh, you could see the rooftops. Yeah, the rooftops. Amazing, amazing yeah. views of rooftops. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And sunsets. I don't, what do you guys do over there? Do you have, a, <laughs> a, do you have some sort of deal going on? Because <laughs> They have just the most amazing cloud and sunsets over there. It just, yeah. it was, it was well, just beautiful. June had a lot of um, a lot of rain this year in June, so you probably had a lot of clouds coming in and leaving and clearing out the the. You know, when it rains a little bit every day, then the air is clean, and it's really good for pictures. <laughs> It's yeah. Good pictures. Yeah, so. and we went out one evening on our own after it had it was uh it had been raining for a little while and so of course the streets are nice and wet which are wonderful for night photography. Yes. Uh and I was more more specifically looking for that wonderful uh typical Paris street maybe with some cobbles if you could find some cobbles. And um, I managed to find a, a side street in in our area around the hotel, and took a couple of uh, of nice photos there with some light trails from the cars and that sort of thing. So. Uh-huh. How much did you use your tripod? I used it uh, probably every day. Um, generally speaking, I didn't take it with us during the day. It wasn't wasn't something I was going to carry around all the time. But it definitely, as we when we went out in the evening, it was with us all the time. Mm-hmm. And how much photo processing did you do? I use Photoshop Lightroom, and I I don't do a lot of stuff to most of my images, but I do. Oh, there's do a couple base. I can tell you fixed yeah. them. <laughs> oh yeah, you, you throw a little contrast into them, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. you know bring up the shadows and the highlights, that kind of thing. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I certainly do that part of it. Um, I, I don't. I'm not a person that'll. Not typically a person that will spend hours editing a single image. I'm more of a five to ten minute guy. Right. So. Yeah, that's what I do too. I'm, I'm and I only do Lightroom. I mean, I just very recently I bought a software called Affinity Photos, mm-hmm. and that's kind of a an easy. Photoshop. It's much easier than Photoshop, which is what, because I didn't really want to take the time to learn Photoshop. I don't, 
need it. Yeah. I, you know, I can do whatever I need in Lightroom for the most part. Right. So anyway. Right. Yeah, but you. So I will invite everybody to go look at the website and go look at Scott's photos. They're very nice. They're, you you really sent me some some very nice photos. Well, you're welcome. It's kind of. I'd like like to give back because your podcasts and and your help made our trip much better. I know that we, we oh, certainly enjoyed good. ourselves. That's good. Hey, tell me, you had how, did you have tips for how to stay on a budget in Paris? We used a travel app called TripCoin. Oh. And uh, because our trip was uh, larger than just uh, the stop in Paris, we actually did travel further into Europe. Uh, we ended up seeing six six cities in six countries mm. over three over three weeks. Wow! Um, but what we did was this this particular app allowed us to break down our expenses based on categories, and then it also allowed us to break it down based on locations. Mm-hmm. So we we had the ability to see how much we had spent uh, on meals or groceries or. You know, we we were we weren't bringing a, bu- a bunch of souvenirs back or anything, so there wasn't right. much spending in that category. Right. But um, for us, it just allowed us to sort of compare. Well, was Paris less expensive than uh, we traveled to Bruges and Amsterdam and a few other locations? But mm. you know, which which cities were most expensive? And interestingly and? enough, well, Paris was. We spent more time in Paris than any other city. Uh, mm-hmm. It was definitely a little more expensive. The number two city on our list was Venice. We were there for three days in uh-huh. Venice, and it was almost as expensive as as four days in Paris. So, wow! Yes, but, so that would make it more exp- a lot twice as expensive as Paris. Yeah, 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 it's 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 not a cheap place, Venice. They right. they certainly are. Uh, they, their hotels are expensive there, much like Paris. I mean, Paris is not a cheap place to stay from a hotel perspective either. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. very good. So that was uh, Tripcoin, you said. Yeah, that's the app. It's called okay. Tripcoin. Huh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. So, so, what do you wish you had known before you went, uh, or that you had done differently, maybe? Um, I, I think. We were fairly well prepared for most of what we did. Um, I don't think we we. Um, I shouldn't say that. Versailles. Mm. <laughs> um, we were we were really. Un- unfortunately, we just didn't have enough time to go to Versailles. Right. And and you know we were not really well prepared for train strikes. I know that. We, True. That was certainly not on our radar when we were looking and booking stuff. And mm-hmm. um, I, I think those were the a couple of the things that when we looked back on it, we were like, yeah, we we wouldn't have thought of that stuff. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's a very like the train strike situation. It, obviously, you can't necessarily plan that. Um, no. Uh, it's just it's just something that is very different um, to have yeah. a strike here in 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 Canada. If they had a strike of of that type, uh, it, it's it's different. It's yeah, it, the behavior is different and and the impacts are different. Well, and this this particular strike was very different than the other uh, ones that they had before, and uh, I'm hoping that they will learn uh, that it didn't. They didn't gain anything by going on strike so long. Mm-hmm. Uh, the law they didn't want passed passed handedly, so they they didn't get any of the things they wanted to get. And so I'm like, well, maybe you should rethink your strategy here. <laughs> but I don't know if they're going to do that. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. We'll see. Yeah, and and then the other item was Versailles, and we really wished we maybe had taken an extra day in our trip and uh, left ourselves time to go to Versailles. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so you, again, you didn't go at all? No, no, just, and, and again, uh, much thanks to you folks was um, just listening to your podcast help us understand how big of a trip Versailles is and yeah. in terms of if you get out there, you probably do want to spend the entire day out there and explore probably. it and see it. Probably, 
And if you don't have the time and you want to see something like Versailles, you could go to Palais Garnier, which is that sort of over-the-top, ornate, beautiful place. It's from a different time period somewhat, but it's, but it's that sort of like very showy, very, very showy place. Of course, Versailles is full of history. Uh, it's, it's completely different, but if, if you, if you want to see gold and, and shiny, Palais Garnier is, is another good choice. Yeah, and, and again, we know there's lots of things on the list to do in Paris, so right. we're going to have to come back. And, <laughs> um, you know, the other side of that is we, I think the next time we would probably venture out a little further into France and see some more of France in general. Yeah, overall, did you think it was a good idea to do six countries? Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah. That, that... We, we went on the idea uh and i think you might have planted this one in, in my head uh make sure you spend three days um and maybe what i'll do is just we went to paris to start then we went up to bruges in belgium and then we went to amsterdam down to prague over to vienna and then down to venice and then back to paris and then home hmm. And we only spent two days in Bruges, which was, in our opinion, uh, enough time in, excuse me, in that city. Mm-hmm. But um, the, the other cities, we spent three. And we never felt rushed. Oh, and good. We, we certainly enjoyed uh, all of those cities and all the, all the interesting things that they have to offer and got a chance to see them and experience them. Mm-hmm. Um, I had traveled to Prague previously, uh, many, many years ago, I'd been in Prague for, mm-hmm. uh, for another reason, but, um, the, the traveling part of it wasn't bad. We enjoyed the train travel. I know that that was probably one of our, our favorites was just getting on the train and, and traveling to the yeah. next city. So, yeah. Oh, cool. Very good. All right. Did I forget to mention any of the things you had prepared to share with everybody? Um, I don't think so. I think we we covered off quite a bit of it. Um, you know, for us, just traveling by ourselves without kids was, was, (laughs) yeah, well, it was fun. (laughs) It was certainly, uh, certainly, uh, our kids are older, they're adults anyway. So, um, you know, they, they, they would have enjoyed the trip anyway, but, uh, no, I, I think we've, Touched on all of the aspects of what we what we did when we were there. You know, it's it's a different type of trip when you're with your when you're with family. Uh, it's completely different. You bring your kids when they're young. Well, that's one type of trip. And you come with your uh, adult uh, children. That's a different type of trip. Uh, you know, it's it's all it all changes everything. But it must. It's very nice once in a while to just go with your spouse and just have a good time. Yeah, yeah, and like you know, for us it was it was an opportunity uh, to see Paris, uh, a city that we had talked about going to a, a few times and never had a chance to. Um, my wife is adamant that we definitely have to go back and and see more <laughs> of it because there's still so much more to see. Yeah, and um, I think you know, being there the first time we're much more comfortable going there a second time. Oh, sure. Uh, and, you know, the, the concerns, I, uh, my wife had a bit of concern with me taking my camera, uh, but I was pretty adamant that it had to go. I, I can't go to a city like yeah. Paris and not have it. Yeah, um, that would have been sad because you you do good photography, so that would have been very sad. You. Yeah. yeah and and s- would you take the 200 again? Uh, yes, I would, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I used it throughout the trip mm. occasionally. It was nice to have it when I had it. And uh, again, just, you know, one of those things when when you're there and you're 90% of the time, I, I would imagine if I looked at my photos, 90% of them are probably shot on my 2470. Yeah. But, but there are a few other photos shot with my 70 to 200 that, I am really glad I had it yeah. when I when I was there because I wouldn't have got 
the composition the way I got it. So. Right, right, right. right. Um, but, you know, and, and just that whole camera business, uh, I, I don't think... I don't think anyone ever once was, you know, looking at me to try and, you know, grab my camera or anything. I use a wrist cuff, you know, to keep mm-hmm. it on my wrist, but, uh, you know, take my picture, put it back in the bag and yeah. move on and that sort of thing. So it, I, I, I felt very comfortable having it with me the whole time. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I've had a similar setup with me on many trips to Paris and other places in France. And, um, it's, it's, I never feel like it's a threat having a camera that they will try and take it from you. That That's yeah. never happened. Yeah. So. And then I, I know you and I had kind of chit chatted a bit about the, the hotel side of things. We, um, we had looked at booking our hotel through a booking site mm-hmm. and, uh, we had looked at the typical ones that, you know, uh, looked yeah. at Agoda, booking.com, yeah. uh, all those various ones. And we ended up actually, uh, I stumbled onto someone's note at some point saying, check with the hotel's website because we oh, were sure. booking our hotel quite, quite a ways in advance. Uh, and if you sometimes check with the hotels, they actually have better prices Mm-hmm. on their on their rooms and we ended up in our case we ended up getting a larger room with mm-hmm. a balcony on the top floor which was nice and mm-hmm. uh it was the same price as what we were going to get from the booking sites which would have just been a, a standard room yeah so that aspect was something that we we didn't realize uh so then of course you you start looking around a little bit more at hotels and you start to go, okay, well, instead of just checking, you know, the, the, the typical hotel websites, I'll, I'll look specifically at each one of the hotels and yeah, see what their prices are like. It's a different process, but yes, you can totally do that and you can often get a little bit better deal. It's not, you know, it's not going to be, you know, 50% less, but no. occasionally you, you get, you know, uh, 5 to 10% discount just because you went through the trouble of, finding the hotel website and, and doing that. Yep. Or calling yeah. them. You could call them too. Sometimes, yeah. I, you know, I always call hotels. I, I'm, I'm old fashioned that way. I just like to call the hotel and talk to them. Yeah. The, the hotel for us was really, they, they were really great. Like they were the ones that arranged the, the car f- service for us and picked us up at the airport. Uh, we hadn't originally planned on just using public transport, but then we weren't sure because of the, the train strikes sort of seemed to spill over to some of the uh, public transit systems at times too. So Yes, it does because, okay, this is crazy, but uh, that line that goes to Charles de Gaulle to CDG, the airport, it's an RER line and it is owned and operated by both uh, RATP, which is the Paris uh, metro system, and SNCF, which is the national tra- train system. So at one point, the tracks they get they're they're managed in the city. They're managed for RATP, and then at one point, and I don't know where exactly that point is, it switches to the train system. That's why that line, when there's a strike, that line is is. Um, there are a lot of problems with it because it's it, no matter who's striking, you're sure to hit a strike. <laughs> so, and besides, I really think that uh, it's so much nicer to take either. Uh, personally, I prefer the taxis because it's a set rate, and uh, you can just whenever you arrive, you go in line for your taxi. In your case, you would have paid fifty-five euros because you were going to the left bank and. Uh, yeah, it's it's a good way to do it, and you don't have anybody waiting for you. Like you know, you f- you don't yeah. feel like you have to rush. Yeah, and we we've used car services like that in New York uh, yeah. before, and it works you know, too. The fe- yeah, the fellow was was great. You know, he was yeah. Here we go and jump in the car and right. no time at all. We're at our hotel and yeah, we were like yeah. There was a lot less stress, especially since you're coming off a long flight and yeah. a bit tired and. Yeah, it works. So. It's good. It's very good. Okay, well, Scott, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to me and sharing your experiences. And I think you had some good tips for everybody. 
And, uh, well, happy travels. Thank you very much and uh, appreciate all the effort that you guys put into your podcast. It's, it's like I say, it certainly helped make our trip that much better. So Wonderful. Au revoir, Scott. Au revoir. Thank you, Jennifer Rankin, Irene Gamboa, Alison Justel, Juestel, that's how I would say it, Kelly, apologies if I massacred your name, Alison, Kelly Baldry, Pam Christison, Paula Keeley, hello, Paula, I know you, uh, Ryuma Tashbin, and Kim Lof for pledging to support the show on Patreon over the last two weeks. And my thanks to all the other patrons who support the show month after month. Thank you so much for giving back. Would you buy me a coffee if we met in real life? You can do that by supporting the show on Patreon for as little as $2 per month. Visit patreon.com forward slash join us. P-A-T-R-E-O-N, join us, no dashes or spaces or anything, where you can see the different reward tiers, and thank you so much for your support. And thank you, Lachlan Cook, for your one-time donation via the Tip Your Guide button on joinusinfrance.com. Thank you also for coming on the podcast once, and we're planning a second episode together about taking the train in France. I want to make it clear that there's no charge for coming on the podcast. Lachlan is just being a wonderful human being, and thank you for supporting what I do. On the last day of 2018, when I wrote this, I was extremely grateful for the 153 patrons who support the show and give me the motivation to continue this labor of love. When I moved back to my own country in 2005, I went on a search to rediscover France, and I have been so lucky to bring you along via this podcast. I am looking forward to 2019, and I hope you do too. What's going to happen with the podcast? After all, it's the beginning of the year. We think ahead. Um, Well, I will continue to produce a show most weeks. I do everything myself for this podcast. It's a big time commitment, but I really love doing it. So that will continue. I may have to skip a week here and there uh, when there are tight deadlines, but expect a show each week most of the time. I will continue to invite you, the listeners, to share your experiences with everyone. You are the stars of the show. So the format of the show is going to stay the same, educational conversations about France that will help anyone who listens for free to prepare their trip to France. I had set a goal for uh, 200 patrons by the end of 2018 and I did not achieve that. Well, I'm a little disappointed, but you know what? I'm going to move right along. Um, Why didn't it work? Well, to make a long story short, asking you to pay for something that you can get for free is kind of a hard ask. (laughs) Lots of um, NPR people work on the donation model and even professional radio teams have a hard time uh, getting enough donations for to support what they do. So, you know, it's this is just how it works. Also, in 2018, I don't think I gave enough attention or emphasis to Patreon rewards. Uh, In 2019, I will make Patreon rewards so good that they'll be a lot harder to resist. I just released two rewards for uh, patrons, one on why so many people are protesting Macron, and another, uh, the first of a series about Napoleon's early childhood. In 2019, I will also publish some books, because I've written several. I've written so many words you would not believe. I now need to put on my big girl pants and finish them, get them edited professionally and published. This is extremely intimidating to me, but I have to find the courage. Uh, This is um, something I've aspired to for many years, and 2019 is the year it happens. Mark my words. (laughs) Um, Another thing is I really want to offer excursions. You who are listening right now, at least most of you, are not looking for week-long tours. I've done several and they've been wonderful, but that's not what most people want, uh, at least not most of the people who listen to this podcast. What many of you have told me is that you'd love to meet me in Paris and do something fun together, just for a few hours. So how about we spend an afternoon exploring the Marais and 
and then we go to dinner together. Or how about I show you around Saint-Germain-des-Prés and Notre-Dame, or, uh, you know, uh, I haven't made the full list yet. But And then we go out together for, for dinner or lunch or something. Um, we could go to Giverny together. Uh, we could go to Père Lachaise together and go to a cafe afterwards. Anyway, I'll be announcing dates for these excursions that will start in May 2019 until October 2019. And uh, they will be on addictedtofrance.com, but I'll talk about it some more. If you liked this episode, you should also check out our First Time in Paris page on joinusinfrance.com. And if you have friends who are coming to France, please tell them that they can listen to the podcast lots and lots of places, including Pandora, Spotify, Alexa, Google Home, YouTube, and of course, on joinusinfrance.com or any of their favorite podcasting app. Thank you so much for listening and for your support of the show. And I will talk to you next week. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2019 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. <laughs>